Uh, we'll get started here then. Um, is there only three weeks left? Unless there's uh, we're having our final exam. It's actually going to be slid up into two parts. The first, the first part of the final is going to be multiple choice. But the second part of the final will be like drawings and this kind of stuff. See, figures, drawings, and uh, nomenclature, and uh, reactions. So, an example would be like draw the Lewis structures or draw the hybridized local scheme, which I call the phalanx bond. We'll talk more about that. And so um, that's why you'll see. This is going to be three hours here. This is uh, an hour and a half. And so it'll be a lot shorter. All right, so what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to work on 10 and 11. I'd like to finish up uh, pretty soon. I've been mixing two topics, but what we'll probably do is we'll just go through this um, chemical bonding. Now, chemical bonding, we have a different types of bonds. Um, what? What are they? Covalent. 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 Ionic. Well, hydrogen bonding is technically like an intermolecular yeah. attraction. The reason is, is it's so much weaker. Um, you know what the typical bond strength is? Actually, we should probably talk about this. For hydrogen bonds is 25 kilojoules per mole. The 25 kilojoules per mole isn't that much. Energy. It is significant compared to other types of intermolecular forces. Attraction is one of the strongest, but compared to bonds, it's quite weak. The weakest covalent bond comes in at around what? Well, that's that's something we'll look at. All right. So as far as bonding goes, we have metallic. Bonds. Metallic bonds um, consist of what we call delocalized electrons. Delocalized electrons, what that means is it's like an ocean of electrons. Electrons can move anywhere in the ocean. Let's see. And then we have the electron C model, where the nuclei are stuck like pure ions. But the electrons are totally mobile. And so this is why, you know, when we think about an electron in a box, you know, the, the electrons in a metal are in a gigantic box. And therefore, quantum propagation effects aren't so noticeable because the half wavelengths are so small. And so the electron C model, which these electrons are truly mobile. These are just the valence electrons. The core electrons are localized. You know, the core electrons aren't mobile, but the valence electrons in the metal are mobile. So the electron C model. This is what gives um, metals their malleability and ductility. You know. For example, if you were to push some of these nuclei, let's say five degrees down you know, relative to the other nucleus, is it really going to break any bonds? No. And so if you move these down a little bit or these around a little bit, as long as they can stay in the proximity, they're okay. And these, these bonds are uh, not localized, that is, they're not directional. And so there's something like the local season. And uh, we can also draw on the wire. You know what that's called? You know, malleability and ductility. Which one is molding it like clay and which one is drawing it wire? Uh, malleability drawn into wire and the other one is 
Okay, shaping it into different shapes. Is that? Actually, uh, just flip it. Flip it. Yeah. yeah, malleability is just shaping it into different shapes. Since it has non directional bonding, what we call non directional. In fact, when you look at gold, do you know how many atoms gold is bonded to? Each atom of gold? Non directional bonding. If I take an atom of gold, there are going to be one, two, three, four, five, six that can fit around it in the plane. And then there are going to be um, three that can come above the plane. One, two, three above the plane. And then there are going to be three below the plane. So the six plus three plus three is how many? Twelve. So each gold atom is bonded to 12 other atoms. That's called the coordination number. And so if we're looking at gold solid, the coordination number is equal to 12, which means it's bonded to 12 other gold atoms. Well, what orbital, what hybridization is that? No, we don't do hybridization here because, you know, hybrid orbitals are local guys. You know, they're very directional. This is delocal. So what orbital is it using then? Well, um, probably the best explanation for metals is not valence bonds, not atomic orbitals. You know what the best explanation for metals is? What's the other competing theory? There are two, well, it's not competing. What's the other, it's complementary because it's too much work. You know, sometimes some things are just too much work and you want to take the easier route. That's valence bond theory. But other times it's not enough. You have to take the hard route, which is called molecular not molecular bond, molecular cloud. Not cloud. Orbital. Molecular orbital theory. MO theory leads to what we call um, bands. Bands of MOs. And since we have bands of MOs, we call it band theory. It, it can be used not just for metals, but it can be used for all solids. You know, because when we treat solids, band theory or solid. I'll just say all solid. But we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't really talked about MO because when we're thinking about a coordination number of 12, you know, um, we got to think, okay, what is going on with the bonding? So we have metallic bonds, and then we have um, covalent bonds. And for covalent bonds, we have uh, two types of covalent bonds. What are they? Yeah, polar and non-polar. We'll have non-polar. Non-polar, we usually use uh, the difference in electronegativity, delta En. And so this is just a gray area. The difference in electronegativity. Do you know what the electronegativity of fluorine is? It's the highest. 4.0. Good. And then the electronegativity of cesium, like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, you know, that's the lowest. No, no units. There are actually multiple electronegativity tables, you know, because those are called the Pauling electronegativities, but some people try to come up with more accurate versions. And so there are. Um, better electronegativity ones that you can use. Um, oh, oh, no. 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 Not another. Water. Okay. Uh, oh, no. It's all right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, crutches cause another accident. No, no, you don't need to. I have cows here. Yeah. I have a lot of cows here.
Yeah, because they just want all my water. Okay, thanks. Okay. Oh, do you, do you can use this sink to wash your hands. So, um, there are other electric negativity tables around. So, we can take a look at that thing. So the typical one is the Pauling's Pauling's electronegativity increases as we go up and right. So fluorine's the most electronegative. What's the least electronegative? Cesium trans. Yeah. And so what are the electronegativity the numbers? We just want to know, you know, the, the lowest and the highest. So if we look at the lowest, francium is 0.7, fluorine is 3.9, whatever, 8, but 4. We'll just call it 4. So francium of 0.7, fluorine. So what is the largest electronegativity difference we can have between two atoms? This can be less than three. Or I guess no, more than three. Yeah, you're right. It would be like um, 3.3? Yeah, yeah. Okay, 3.3 is going to be the biggest electronegativity difference. And what's the smallest electronegativity difference? Well, the smallest would be like hydrogen to hydrogen or something, or chlorine to chlorine, chlorine to chlorine. That would be um, zero. Yeah. Okay, so for nonpolar, we expect a delta EN of zero to about 0.5, roughly. And then we'll have nonpolar. An example of this would be like, uh, let's do chlorine. Chlorine has electronegativity of what? So let's take a look at the chlorine of the Uh, this is too precise. 3.0. Three three we should use R from the book. A little less precise. We don't have to do that exactly. Because the problem is, is these are kind of rough anyway. The electronegativities aren't. We'll just say 3.0 for chlorine. Yeah. Chlorine's 4.0, cesium's 0.7. This is must be European using comments to the period. Anyway, 3.0, 3.0, delta EN is zero. So this is perfectly nonpolar um, covalent. HCl is not, you know, HCl. HCl, what would that be? Yeah. Hydrogen is interesting because hydrogen belongs between boron and carbon. Close to the boron, so it's kind of in the middle. There. And so hydrogen is a 2.1, chlorine is a 3.0, and the difference is 0 0.9. And so this is polar. How about hydrogen and carbon? This is nonpolar here. If it's polar, we do what's called the bond dipole, or delta plus, delta minus. And so um, hydrogen has a partial positive charge here. Chlorine would have a partial negative charge. Yeah. And then if we look at the electrostatic potential map, do you know what colors we'd see for this? An the electrostatic potential map, um, we have three main colors. We'll have blue, red, and green. Green. So this would be all green. So if we look at chlorine and electrostatic potential map, it's pretty much all green. It means that there's no polarization of charge. If we look at um, something like HCl, we're going to see red and blue. And so which end would be red? Remember, it's backwards from what you would think intuitively. 
that would be uh, hydrogen would be positive. Right. Red is positive. Is it? Is that uh, is that intuitively or counterintuitive? I mean, what do you think? Normally, when you think of red, do you think positive or negative? Normally, when I think of red, I think batteries, and when you look at battery terminals, red is always positive. Do you know that? Yeah. The yellow in the middle? The odd. Yeah, those are odd. Uh, but it's not, it's just showing it. The yellow is going to be in a certain range. And this is this has to do with size as well. And so the size does some funny stuff in the transition element block. Here the size stays flat. And here the size goes down. But there's some other effects here. There are there are other effects, um, especially with these heavy metals. With these heavy metals here, like gold, um, some of the properties are a little um, different from what we would expect. And so there's a modified version of quantum mechanics. The modified version of quantum mechanics is um, goes in the theory of relativity for these. And so there's relativistic effects when you get to certain heavier metals that can screw things up. But, but that might not be the reason this is. You know, the yellow is just some intermediate, and so if it turns out in this range, you have to be intermediate. But the, the, the numbers aren't so different. You know. But we know that this is kind of flat. And you know why it's flat? In terms of size. Electronegativity is going to depend on size, too. The smaller the atom, the higher the electronegativity is expected. Because of the, what we're talking about, shielding. There are numerous factors. It's hard to, hard to um, keep track of all those. But ultimately, when we want, we want to know how this molecule is going to behave. If we want to know how it's going to behave, then we need to know how the electron cloud is around the molecule. You know, what parts of the molecule are positive, what parts are negative, and what potential reactions can occur. And so all, all this is fairly green here. Over here, the hydrogen is going to be blue or red? Blue, and the chlorine is going to be red. Um, and then uh, let's take a look at one more. Before. What about a carbon-hydrogen bond? Yeah, carbon is a 2.5. And uh, hydrogen is 2.1, therefore our delta EN here is 0 0.4. 0 0.4 means it's in the nonpolar, but it's just very slightly polar. And so you might see a little bit of red and blue. And so let's take a look at some electrostatic potential now. And this is why we are doing all this stuff with the orbitals and whatnot. Try to kind of generate the visual picture. Of what's going on? You say chemistry. Haban clofenilamide. Clofenilamide is a chemotherapy agent. Did I show you the video on sulfonilamide? No. What I did. Yeah, we want to know certain things like this. Do you see the red? And the blue, the green. This is going to be what's going on with electrons. Where is the electron cloud? And so we can build this kind of stuff up. I want to 
think they still show this. Okay, we're gonna show up then. You want to see it? I'm even stuck to look the moment because I thought it did show it earlier. Maybe I won't show. We have to use this spe these speakers here. Yeah. Can yes. you hear? Yeah, we can hear. This is I wonder why the speakers, the room speakers, aren't working. It's old, but it's still. The number and variety of living systems is remarkable. Watch out for the copyright videos. Yeah, so here we have a very, um, we have the 3.0 versus 3.0. Here we have a 2.1 versus 3.0. And so even though we're going to have overlap here, this is the SP3, that's correct, and the hydrogen should be a S. And so we're going to have an S SP3. Again, we're going to have an overlapping probability um, cloud here, and that's going to increase the. The dots there, and that's what's going to hold this together. However, 
since chlorine has a stronger pull, it's going to be polarized, then electrons will spend more time around chlorine than around hydrogen. And so we end up polarizing this bond here. And so this bond will look green. Um, however, over here, the hydrogen will be blue and the chlorine will be red in this case. And so we indicate that by using deltas. This is partial positive, partial negative. It's not a full charge. It's a partial charge, meaning it's not plus one and minus one in the ionic because hydrogen doesn't completely let go. If hydrogen completely let go, then it'd be ionic. Or we use this. The um, kind of vector dipole here. The arrowhead points to the negative end, and this is you know, the positive tail. This would be polar covalent. And then around, um, around, so delta EM of around two, we go ionic. It varies. It's not perfectly correlated. And so delta EN is about two is ionic. And so if we did sodium and chlorine, it would look different. So when sodium reacts with chlorine, chlorine this this sodium. Sodium is about 0.8, is it? Point eight or point nine? What is point nine? Point is three point zero. It gives us a two point two, two point one. <coughs> Which means chlorine is going to be much stronger, and so chlorine is still going to be sp three hybridized. So the, the structure that we're going to be looking at is sodium is going to completely lose that electron, and so the Lewis structure looks like this, where we draw square brackets around. And chlorine's going to be sp3, but it's going to have four sp3 orbitals in the tetrahedral geometry with all lone pairs. And so this is going to give us four points. Here, in this case, there's no sharing, you know, essentially, the lone pair and the electron cloud over here. And so, what's holding it together then? There's no sharing. What's holding it together are the full charge. This is not a partial charge, this is full positive and full negative. And so we have an ionic bond. An ionic bond is attraction between oxygen and charge um, particles. And so that's what we see here. And so all the bonds are electrical in nature. No, we draw the Lewis structures differently. So if we have a um, Covalent, we show that with a line, or two lines for double, or three lines for triple. If we have ionic, we don't show it that way. Even if we have something like um, sodium carbonate. Here, we don't do electronegativity differences because we know that carbonate's already an ion and sodium is an ion too. So sodium ions, if I want to draw the Lewis structure for sodium carbonate, I draw a sodium ion like this. And then I'm going to draw my carbonate. Here I'm going to pick one of the three resonance forms to draw. Or I could draw the resonance hybrid. Each of the oxygens down on the bottom here. Negative charges. And then another seven nine here. So they're covalent bonds in the carbonate, like two singles and a double. And they're ionic bonds between the ions here. I'm showing it differently. Now, um, as far as bond energies go, let's take a look at some bond energies here. 
you know, how strong are these bonds? Here's carbonate, by the way. Is, uh, carbonate has three resonance forms, depending on where you draw the double bond. I drew it on the top here, so I just picked the third resonance form here. You could also draw it on the left or the right. Double bonds are shorter or longer than single bonds? Well, shorter. Shorter and stronger. The reason when we have a double bond, uh, look at this double bond here. We're going to look at it side view. So I have a carbon and I have an oxygen. What's the hybridization on the oxygen? SP2. What's the hybridization on the carbon? SP2. So the first thing is we have this sp2, sp2. We call them sp2, sp2 sigma bond. And the electron cloud is going to be here. And because we'll have an electron here. An electron here. Okay. No, or the electrons can be anywhere in that region. This is one half of the double bond. Do you know what the other half of the double bond is? Yeah, the unhybridized p orbital. So we'll have a p orbital here, this one orbital, and then a p orbital here. And these can overlap. Even though they don't look like they can overlap, they can overlap because the orbitals are actually infinitely big. All orbitals are infinitely big, but you know, the probability of finding it decreases dramatically. And so if we have an electron here and an electron here, let's say, no, then we, we're going to get overlap here and here. Which one do you think is stronger? You know, because the nuclei are positive. So if you look at the nuclei, and there's positive here and positive here. Which one do you think is stronger? The sp2 overlap or the pp overlap? The sp2 overlap. Because it's in, within the internuclear axis. If the overlap is within the internuclear axis, we call it sigma. But when you look at the P overlap, it's outside the internuclear axis. So here, the nuclei are going to be attracted straight on one another. Over here, the nuclei are going to be attracted here and here and here and here. So when we have this kind of overlap here and here, we call that pi. So we name this sp2, sp2 sigma, which is stronger than the p, p, pi. And so essentially there are two bonds here. Those two bonds are going to constitute the double bond because it's two atoms that are bonded in these two ways. And so we're just looking at the attractions here between the nuclei. Bond energies uh, depend on you know, how many were, were breaking off. So take a look at this hydrogen up here, H2, and we want to break that bond. We can figure out, you know, what, uh, what photons, what light can break this bond. You know, we shine a certain energy of light and breaks the bond. And then we can convert that photon energy into kilojoules per mole. And so we, we figure out a hydrogen hydrogen bond takes 435.93 kilojoules per mole to break. A hydrogen oxygen bond is a little bit stronger. Do you see? The hydrogen oxygen bond takes close to 500 kilojoules per mole. But this is for the first in water. 
To break the second bond in water doesn't take the same amount of energy. It actually takes a little less energy because it's going to be stabilized. And so hydrogen oxygen bond is 500 and 428 here. And so it varies. And so what we do is we compile an average. And uh, we look at the average bond energy. So these would be a table of average bond energy. These are covalent bond energies here. And we also have metallic bond energies and ionic bond energies. So looking at covalent bond, you know, um, covalent bonds can be pretty easy to break. Which ones would be the easiest covalent bonds to break? Well, yeah, the easiest one to break would be the one that has the lowest bond energy. That would be oxygen. Oxygen, oxygen. This is the peroxide bond here. The peroxide bonds are very easy to break. And the reason they, the structural reason why people, um, or what's happening there is the bond distance is too close that the two nuclei repel. So when I drew the electrostatic potential map, the bond distance is too close. Well, then why does it equilibrate a little farther? Uh, it doesn't. And so it, 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 it has something to do with nuclei um, repelling one another. And the other one would be iodine. The reason for iodine would be the big orbitals, the big orbital, you can't concentrate the negative charge that much. It's going to result in a weak bond. So we want to know like peroxide bonds are exceptionally weak. That way, that's one of the reasons why we try to avoid making peroxide bonds in Lewis structures. If you can avoid a peroxide bond, it's best to avoid a peroxide bond when you're doing Lewis structures. And so we try to figure out all kinds of ways to avoid that. Whereas carbon-carbon bonds, no problem. Carbon-carbon bonds are strong, so we can make lots of carbon-carbon bonds in a row. But can we make a lot of oxygen-oxygen bonds in a row? No. However, oxygen-oxygen double bond looks pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, oxygen-oxygen double bond is good. I saw and it's because carbon is plentiful and it creates such a nice, um, strong bond by itself. Yeah, um, in, in a lot of ways, sulfur, I mean, not sulfur, silicon and carbon are similar yeah. because they like to form four bonds. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, there are some oils. You know, a lot of oils are carbon based oils, like motor oil for your car. But it turns out that some of these silicon ones are actually quite strong, a bit stronger. So you can buy like silicone, you know, they have silicone rubbers that, that you can throw in the oven, uh, baking sheets that don't start to burn. Whereas if you put like a carbon polymer in there, it would start to burn and decay. And so in some respects, you know, silicon is stronger um, bonds. We use, I used to use silicon pump oil for my vacuum pump. This is like a hundred dollars compared to like a carbon-based oil, which is like twenty bucks. You know? But the silicon was much better for temperature, high temperatures, and lasted a lot longer. But we don't have the variety. I mean, you would think, you know, I'm sure that the, the, the uh, extraterrestrial it's not not as abundant as you mentioned, but I'm sure the NASA astrobiologists have been looking at <coughs> silicon based planets. Maybe they even published something recently. I haven't looked. Yeah, silicon based life form. They were making a grow like that. Let's see. Silicon chips. Last and astrobiologist. If you have a silicon based life form, you can walk like a rubber bullet, just the more weight you have, and it's stretch up and down for less. This one, I don't think it's going to be real. 
you might think if you're interested in this kind of stuff, she's at UC Riverside. Oh. This is interesting stuff. I'm, I'm interested if there's light on the other side. Uh, how similar, similar they could if be. If we did ever find it, it would be such a scary spot. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, we just put it there before we find it. Why are we saying we found life on another planet? Wait a second. No. Yeah. 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 But uh, that wasn't a very useful for silicon based life form. It would be scary if the facility life had been actually taught. It doesn't make any sense. For me, it wouldn't have had voice practice. I could have thought of different types of biochemistry. What's that back in the day? <laughs> the element silicon has been discussed as a hypothetical carbon. It's tetra tetravalent means it's like the has four valent electron uh, valence electrons. Well, if it had waste track, then it would be not it's four bond. Two with the male to randomize the gene pool more than the So it's higher than the yeah, but think about learning silicon based life forms. Maybe we don't have to worry about our genetic problems because we don't have a gene for the gene scope. Yeah, but the same time, just changing and then surviving is part of it. If they're going to solve it, they're going to have to use the same type of thought that we had, right? Yeah, I mean, that would be the life forms. I was thinking, like, imagine if, right, like, for us, the reason why we have so many like genetic based diseases, right, and diseases that can affect us, what is it, biological or genetic diseases? It's just like that one. Yeah. What if it's because like if we were to compare it to say another life form, we're just unstable. Well, actually, I'm finding it's much more stable than yours. So yours will just be RNA, and I'm finding that it's much more stable than DNA. So, and the common mutation now is if we. That being the place or this place, it's, it's a bunch of stuff, right? But I don't know if that would be because you're gonna have to mutate to survive like the change in your life to evolve that. We'll have to do the uh, the mundane stuff here. So, so um, let's let's talk about bond energies since we're talking about stability. Yeah. So bond energies, tell me some bond energies. Well, tell me about covalent bond energies. What do they vary from what to what? What's the weakest around? Let's say 100, close enough to 100. Yeah. So 100, that for two. What's a thousand? 100 to 1,000 units? Uh, kilojoules per mole. And so what has 1,000 kilojoules per mole? Uh, so nitrogen. Yeah, the nitrogen, nitrogen, triple bond. And I mean, that bond energy makes nitrogen very unreactive. It, it, Costs a lot of energy to breathe the nitrogen nitrogen triple bond. And so the nitrogen that you're breathing, air is what, 80% nitrogen? The nitrogen you're breathing is fairly inert. It's not doing anything to you, it's taking out the lung volume. Yeah, but it's important for composition of air because what we're accustomed to. So um, the nitrogen nitrogen triple bond, extremely strong. And so this is why people were trying to get. Um, nitrogen is a reactive thing. It's very difficult to get nitrogen to reactive things, but you know, biological organisms are amazing, like legumes. You know, legumes can fix nitrogen, that is, get nitrogen into its very inert to actually react. And so, um, this is for covalent bonds. What about metallic bonds? We know that metallic bonds have a very wide range of bond energy because some metals are extremely difficult to melt. Do you know, can you name some metals? Do you know what metals have the highest melting point? Uh, yeah, tungsten has extremely high melting point. That's why they use it in light bulb filaments because they want it to grow. All those things to get oxidized. It would probably be better. It would be much better not to use tungsten because tungsten, tungsten you can oxidize pretty easily. It would probably be much better if you can use what for light bulbs. What's a, a metal with a very high melting point that doesn't oxidize easily. 
Yeah. Titanium? Lead oxidizes pretty easily. Titanium oxidizes pretty easily. Gold. Gold. It would be best if you could make your light bulb filaments out of gold. Gold, um, gold, uh, gold has a fairly high melting point as well as silver. I think platinum. No, so it turns out the species with very high melting point and high density would be here. These ones in the center of the B block. Tungsten, rhenium, osmium, iridium, platinum, gold. Yeah, the yellow group. These ones are um, these ones are very dense and they have strong bonds, and so they're hard to melt. But what metals are easy to melt? Um, copper, nickel. Now, those are still very hard in temperature. The ones that's easy to melt are these, like cesium. You know the melting point of cesium? Close to yeah. temperature. Or uh, <laughs> Sodium melts at 100 degrees C. Well, that's sugar. Silver is still hard, not so easy to melt. I mean, it's easier to melt than some of the others, but it's still not hard to easy to melt. Mercury is easy to melt, but mercury is mercury is a bit different than what's expected, and that has to do with relativistic effects. Relativistic effects are when the, en the electron energies get so high that the speed of electrons approaches the speed of light and causes some unusual um, properties that are associated with that. What about the ionic bonds? Ionic bonds, we have a lattice here. And it depends on the lattice. Some lattices are easy to melt, but are salts in general easy to melt or difficult to melt? Difficult. That means the bonds must be quite strong. And so um, for uh, ionic compounds, the energies are hundreds to thousands, like three, several thousands, not to say thousands of kilojoules per mole. And so something like magnesium oxide is like over 2,000 kilojoules per mole. And magnesium oxide is just Mg2 plus and O2 minus. But the thing is, an ionic bond is not one bond. We call those lattice of bonds. The reason we call those lattice of bonds is because how many ion bonds are there in a mole of magnesium oxide? There are a lot. Because this is just one unit, formula unit, we call it. We have many packed together in a solid. And so what we have to do is we have to sum all these up. Et cetera, over three dimensions. So when we do that over three dimensions, we say there's lots of bonds. And so this is why when we look at something like magnesium oxide versus something like nitrogen, magnesium oxide um, bond energy is going to be much, much higher. We'll, we're going to look at that in the lattice energy later in another chapter. But for covalent, metallic will have a wide range from very weak to quite strong. Um, so one application of bond energy is to estimate um, delta H of reaction. Delta H of reaction can be approximated. These are average bond energies, which are called. So 
So their average, we don't know the spread. Usually when we have an average like that, we want to know how many samples and what's the spread. In other words, we want the 95% confidence interval, but we don't have the 95% confidence interval here. So the delta A of reactions is approximate. And so what we're going to have is we're going to have the sum of the um, delta H, that is the energy or the enthalpy of the bonds, broken minus the sum of the delta H of the bonds form. So this um, will allow us to avoid doing uh, calorimetry. It will allow us to avoid doing um, Hess's law, although this is an application of Hess's law. Um, pretty much this is Hess's law. And so we can just pick a reaction, for example. What was the delta H of combustion for methane around 890? And so we'll do an example here. Let's calculate it. It's going to be methane plus 202 is going to yield CO2 plus 2H2O liquid. And so in order to use this, we have to look at all the bonds. And so we'll have to draw the Lewis structures. Nothing has this Lewis structure. This is the Lewis structure, but how would I draw this Like if I tried to draw it more three-dimensionally? What shape is this molecule? Tetrahedral. Well, the typical way we draw tetrahedral is like this. So that would be. And then we have um, two O2s. And so oxygen, uh, we draw the Lewis structure for oxygen. And uh, we're going to come out with less than octet. And so for oxygen, we'll have to uh, resort to double bonding. This is going to form CO2 which is linear and H2O two of them which will be bent at 109 not linear but we're just doing this for our count and so um, what are the bonds broken here? Well, carbon hydrogen bonds are broken, right? How many carbon hydrogen bonds are being broken? Four. And each carbon hydrogen bond has a bond energy of 414. And so, in this example, we're going to have four carbon hydrogen bonds, four at 414 kilojoules per mole. I'm not going to continue this. Okay. Plus, how many oxygen oxygen double bonds? Two oxygen oxygen double bonds at what energy? 498. Minus, okay, what are the bonds that we're forming? We're forming um, two carbon oxygen bonds. Yeah. Double bonds. Two carbon oxygen double bonds at 736. 736. What's B? Let's read what B is. It's surprising how many people don't read the footnotes to the table. You shouldn't be. It's a really common that I've heard over and over. A, although all data are listed with about the same precision, three significant figures, some values are actually known more precisely. Specifically, for the values for the diatomic molecules, H2HF, HCl, HCr, HI, H2O2, et cetera, are actually bond dissociation energies rather than average bond energy. And so the ones that are known precisely aren't averages. There's only one bond, and that's the energy for that bond. The others are averages. B, the value for the carbon-oxygen double bond in CO2 is 799 kilojoules per mole. 
So are we in CO2? Yes, we are. So we yes. shouldn't use 736. We should, we, should use, we should use 799. Good thing we read the footnote. Otherwise, we would have gotten the worst answer. Okay, um, plus how many um, hydrogen oxygen bonds? Four. And each hydrogen oxygen bond is 464. So let's see what the number comes out to. Can somebody calculate this for me? Yes. Well, we're out of time anyway. So. I mean, I could. I would be able to calculate it. I mean, I could. I probably just left that whole lot of now. We'll get it next time. Oh, wait, it lost time. <laughs> what did you get? 2910. Must have screwed up something because it should be close to minus 890. So I'm not sure the numbers are. Let me double check it again. Okay. I'm going to go in I got minus 802. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Minus 802. It's way off, but it's okay because it's just an easy way to estimate it. Thank you.